and welcome to Culture on I-24 News. I'm Olivia Grober, happy to be here as always. Today on our program, we'll talk to the creators of a book about the top ethnic restaurants in Israel. And we'll hear the sounds from Organist Cameron Carpenter's concert earlier this month. Israel's Top 100 Ethnic Restaurants is a new e-book published by the World Jewish Heritage Fund presenting the small everyday food establishments in Israel that tra travelers might otherwise miss. It was created by Israeli chef and food critic Gil Chovav and by Jack Gottlieb, president of the fund. I'm very happy to have them both in the studio to tell us all about it. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for Pleasure. Like. Jack, let's begin with you. Uh, how did this uh, e-book come about? What prompted you to, to, to get this ball rolled? Well, we noticed that uh, when you use uh, the uh, you know, technological media like uh, Google and TripAdvisor and the kind of uh, you know, medium that uh, tourists would normally consult, you right. would miss all the small ethnic places that uh, Israelis know about mm -hmm. um, that tourists simply don't know about. So we decided to solve that problem. Yeah. And it, it is a problem, and there is a solution. Uh, that's where Gil came in, right? Yeah, well, we consulted with him, and, and uh, he said it sounds like a great project because Gil is a big fan of uh, small restaurants, small ethnic restaurants. And mm -hmm. so, so he consulted with us all along, and we were really glad to have him as a mentor. Gil, I guess the question, the first question that comes to my mind is, I see the word ethnic, and yep. it kind of shouts out at me. And what is ethnic food? What is, is there non-ethnic food? Yeah, there is, there is. We live in a modern world, and when you talk about fusion, it would be non-ethnic anymore. Okay. But the, the, the nice part about Israeli food is that, you know, people came from all over the world. They didn't even bother to try and adopt their neighbor's techniques. So you do have... Persian restaurants, you mm -hmm. do find Georgian restaurants, you do find French restaurants, American restaurants, British restaurants, everything is in Israel. And uh, they're proud of their food, they're proud of their heritage, and I think that it's one of the nicest assets of Israel gastronomically, that you can really, you know, walk one street and find food from all over the world. Yeah. And it's, it's a pity that people miss it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but there's also, you know, in, in a country like Israel, even uh, uh, such a thing as, a, as food or, or a, a book about restaurants would have some political meaning, some political undertones. How did you uh, manage that? So, so far, the book is about Jewish food. So it's about, you know, food that Jewish people brought from the diaspora and that they eat in, you know, their country, in yeah. Israel. Uh, but we are going to broaden it. It's going to be about ethnic food all over Israel, be it Christian, be it Druze, be it Muslim, be it, because there's such great food and great chefs in Israel that yeah. it's a pity to miss. It is. It really is. Now, we should say it already includes uh, uh, restaurants that are could be considered uh, Arab. There are hummus places and, and uh, uh, places, uh, we just saw Dr. Shakshuka that serves uh, shawarma. Try to tell an Israeli that hummus in, is Arab. We're going to get into <laughs> It was adopted by Israel, and it's considered completely Jewish now. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. called the, uh, it's called the, the Chumas Tabuli question. Uh, who created it first? And you know, who owns it who now? Owns now yeah. Right? yeah, Chumas is mentioned in the Bible, so we're kosher. <laughs> so it's definitely Jewish, yeah. Uh, now, there are plenty of uh, you know, high-end restaurants in Israel as well, but these are not the places that, that we're focusing on no. here. No, not at all. In fact, uh, it's the opposite. You know, if it was, if it's high end, it's probably not in the book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but at the same, by the same token, you know, in the next version, uh, we'd like to uh, talk more about the new Israeli kitchen, which takes, uh, you know, the ingredients of the old kitchen and uh, remakes it into something new. Mm -hmm. And we want to get a little more into that. And hopefully, Gil will kind of guide us through that process because there are people that really, really diverge very far away, and there are people that kind of stick to their roots. Gil, as a chef yourself, are you uh, tough with these places? I mean, when you go into a place that's like an, uh, you know, a lunch place for, it's not trying to be a, a three-star Michelin uh, restaurant. Are you, uh, do you try to hold them to a higher standard or are you more uh, kind of accepting and willing to, to play this game? Completely accepting. It, it, it's, it, it's a wild zoo over there. <laughs> and this is part of the fun. Like, I think that my favorite ethnic restaurant in Israel 
Israel would be a restaurant near Tel Aviv called Beho Red Shoshi. It's a Libyan restaurant, and there, the feature that they're most proud of is that instead of napkins, they give you toilet paper. <laughs> now, an American tourist may find this a bit, you know, intimidating, but this is Israel. This is yeah. Israel. Yeah. And, and I want it to stay this way. Yeah, definitely. Um, you you went with traditional places, or you were able to find because you know there are mostly for Israelis. There are like these few places that everybody knows as this authentic places that I'm sure are highlighted in the book. Were you able to find you know something that that surprised you? Some some place that you didn't know? Well, uh, yeah. No, I just wanted to say is that uh, we we found these places you know through some kind of a consensus through bloggers and uh, newspaper articles and everything else. So we mm -hmm. tried to develop what Gil knows. Okay, these are the really, really smaller places, and we're going to kind of put those in eventually. But, uh, but, but Gil really knows, you know. He knows you know, his stuff. He, know, yeah. he, he, knows, he knows the places that Israelis don't know. Don't know. <laughs> yeah. But still, so I what, must say that me, I did You told find Americans them. Uh, uh, about places that even Israelis don't know? Yet? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that it's, you know, you come to a country as a tourist. You have free time. Yeah. Go and explore. Don't just go to places under your hotel. Go Go, you know, a few blocks away, and and you'll find treasures. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I've looked through the book, uh, through the ebook, and there are, there are some great places, and a few places that I didn't know. So there are certainly uh, uh, even Israelis, even locals, can find something. Um, let's talk a little bit about World Jewish Heritage. Tell sure. me about the organization, because I have to admit, I. I didn't know it before. Sure. Yeah. Um, the whole idea of uh, the World Jewish Heritage is really to try and portray the whole idea of Judaism through culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our first cultural project, you know, that we uh, took on was food. Um, and Jewish food, food is a major part of Jewish life. No, yeah, everybody knows that. Jewish. Yeah. Next yeah. subject is mothers. No, no. <laughs> guilt. <laughs> <laughs> no, the next subject after uh, food is going to be music, obviously. And nobody's really done a good job of, uh, you know, you know, showing ethnic music, of mm -hmm. which there's so much, you yeah. know, that uh, yeah. that could be done. But really, the food is going to keep us uh, busy. We're going to have an ebook for uh, North America. We're going to have an ebook for Europe, um, and we also have to. Uh, gonna, we're going to add the Arabic places to right. uh, the right. non-Jewish places yep. to round it out in Israel. In Israel. So it, it's a franchise. You know, what a news, uh, newspaper reporter told me, well, you, we have a franchise here. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize I had a franchise yeah, when I started. We, but, we uh, sure are. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a great initiative, and the, the result looks uh, wonderful and with really good food. I'm looking forward to the next time I can uh, try one of these yeah, places. Yeah, and I'm hoping everybody will, you know, will uh, consult our uh, uh, Instagram account. And, right. and this is a community resource project. We want to use your pictures. And well, if you find it, we find really good pictures. We're going to include them in the book. You know, uh, for these restaurants all over the world. Pictures of, of food on Instagram. Who who? Yeah, who would have thought? Who would have imagined? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, uh, Gil, Jack, uh, once again, thanks for coming in. Well, thank, thank you, you so for much. Inviting us. Now. Pipe organ virtuoso Cameron Carpenter is uh, regarded as one of the most revolutionary musicians of our time, probably the most eclectic organ player in the world. This month, he had his debut show in Israel at the Elma Arts Complex Hotel in Zichon Yaakov. Daniel Campos and David Yakin were there to meet Cameron and bring us the story. Rebellious, unorthodox, blasphemous. His stage presence stirs the audience even before he begins to play. His immediate acknowledgement and appreciation of the spectators made it clear that he isn't a snobbish character. Obviously, it's not that easy to play. <laughs> be the impression from watching the preview video of his album, where he's driving a four-wheel drive luxury Mercedes Benz, wearing diamonds in his high-heeled shoes, and stripping off his shirt to show off his fit body. Carpenter often performs on his digital international touring organ, which he himself designed, and which was built by Marshall and Ogletree. But for his concert at the Elma Hotel, he would inaugurate the 1,470 pipe organ built last year by the German firm Orgelbau Kleiss, 
the only one of its kind in the Holy Land. It is also among the few pipe organs that is not in a church or a music school. With his feet gracefully touching the pedals as if he was walking on clouds, he struck the first chords of prelude number one of Bach's cello suite. Mellow and familiar to the audience, it turned out to be a great choice for his debut concert in Israel. For Cameron Carpenter, performing in the Middle East is a rare thing, due to the lack of presence of the instrument in the region compared to Europe. But his goal is to perform more often in the region in the same way he does everywhere else. He doesn't believe in customized performances to satisfy conservative audiences. It's certainly my intention to play more in the Middle East and always to play as myself and to the degree possible to do everything I can to encourage others to, to feel you know, safe and, and strong about expressing themselves um, in their sexuality and in their personalities. Uh, everyone wins when we do that. Because of my respect for activists and the fact that I have some activists as friends, I certainly wouldn't presume to consider myself an activist simply because I'm open about being bisexual. But um, I do think it's important um, for not just for GLBT rights, but for human freedoms in general, and in a way also for, for women's rights, um, that we not only uh, have protections uh, for GLBT people and for women, but also that we be able to talk about human sexuality in an open, um, as some would say, a proud way. Cameron Carpenter is known for his secular approach to the instrument, which has strong religious connotations. Many have even called him blasphemous due to his secular opinions about the pipe organ and religion, which go beyond the music. We're beginning to see that the, um, the stronghold of bias and, and religion and it is, is really generally one of fear. Um, and it's a fear that is, is in every possible way, not only unfounded and undeserved, but of course immensely destructive. For him, the organ is a miracle of science and not of religion. That fascination drove him to study the pipe organ at New York's prestigious Juilliard School. It is hard to imagine what would Bach, Chopin, and Liszt think and feel about Carpenter's interpretation of their music. Whether they would like it or not, we could be assured that this organ rebel couldn't care less and would continue doing things his own way. We're nearly done for today, but first, here's our cultural recommendation for the day. The misfortune of some is the happiness of others. This week, the old continent commemorates the Battle of Waterloo, June 18th of 1815. This dreary plain, as Victor Hugo described it, witnessed the fall of the Emperor Napoleon and the victory of the British General Wellington, depending on your point of view. 200 years later, it is the place of the famous battle that the Wellington Museum presents an exhibition tracing the fate of the two men to slip into the lives of both soldiers and politicians 250 objects that belong to them, the famous cone hat of the British idol, and you will understand that the two men did not have the same fate, not the same charisma, and what ultimately history will choose the first defeat of the victorious. And do not miss the reenactment of the battle on the occasion of the anniversary from June 18th to the 20th.
That's it from us. But before we go, here is Moroccan singer Saad Lamjarid, who has uh, broken a YouTube record in the Arab world with over 46 million views for his video Lamalim, a hit which also remains firmly planted at number one in charts all around the Arab world. Here it is. Enjoy. <laughs> نسكت وانت موجود ما نرضى نتكلم نسكت وانت موجود ما نرضى نتكلم انت معلم واحنا منك نتعلم انت معلم واحنا منك نتعلم نسكت وانت موجود ما نرضى نتكلم نسكت وانت موجود ما نرضى نتكلم واللي خلاك ما يفهم يجي نور 